Hello everyone and welcome back to another tutorial. In this tutorial we will be looking at the theory behind molecular dynamics. Molecular dynamics is a method in computational biochemistry used to simulate the behaviour of atoms. It treats all atoms as balls connected by springs and completely ignores electrons. In molecular dynamics no bonds are created or destroyed. In a molecular dynamics simulation the simulation time is divided up into time steps of equal length, the coordinates of the atoms changing with each time step. The forces acting on the atoms, and therefore their velocities, are calculated from their energy. Atoms will move in a specific direction that best decreases their energy. We can imagine this as a three-dimensional field where the atom, or imaginary balls, roll down the direction of the gradient. Their energy is itself calculated using a potential energy function, also called a force field, that computes the energy of each atom based on coordinates and structural data as well as a set of defined parameters, also called force field parameters. Most force field equations can be summed up as follows. The total energy of an atom consists of a sum of its energy associated with its bonded interactions as well as the energy from non-bonded interactions. In a molecular dynamic simulation, the total energy, i.e. the sum of the potential and kinetic energy of the system, should remain constant. A basic molecular dynamic cycle can be described as follows. First, your program reads in the coordinate and structural information of your system, as well as any initial velocities. Then, the atomic energies are calculated using our potential energy function. From these energies, the force acting on each atom is computed. The forces can be used to calculate the acceleration of each atom in a, in a particular direction. These are then used to generate new coordinates for each of our atoms, as well as their new velocities. The program checks if n, the specified number of time steps, has elapsed. If not, the program repeats the cycle and computes new coordinates for the system. This cycle is repeated until n number of time steps has elapsed at which point the program will write all of its computed data in an output file and terminate. We can then post-process this file and look at our results. Looking at the system in more detail, the system information is first specified, usually in a group of files. A coordinate file, such as a PDB or XYZ file, a structural file, such as a PSF or GROW file, and usually a force field parameter file, such as a PRM file. Most molecular dynamic simulation programs use an input script where you specify the names of these files, or even copy the file information into the actual input script. We will look at the energy function in our next slide. Having calculated the energy of an atom, let's call it U of atom X, we can see that the force acting on it will be the negative derivative of U of X. Seeing as our atoms are not one but three dimensional, the force will be a combined partial derivative of each of the principal axes. Don't be intimidated by the math, it's just splitting up the derivative into three parts that each deal with one of the three dimensions to then get a three-dimensional force vector. Finally, we can use Newton's second law to calculate the acceleration acting on each atom. As you can see here, this will also depend on atomic mass and therefore the element that each atom is representing. Using the acceleration and an already specified time step duration, for example, one femtosecond per step, we use some kind of function to calculate our new atomic coordinates and velocity. We then return back to calculating our energies once more. The best way I can explain a potential energy function is by having a look at an example, such as the charm force field. Here we can see that according to the charm force field, the total energy of an atom consists of its energy associated with the bonding and the non-bonding interactions. The bonding energy is itself composed of the sum of the energy associated with the atomic bonds, the atomic angles, atomic dihedrals and atomic impropers. You may also wonder what the UB term stands for. This is a term that is found in the charm force field specifically, called the Uri bradley term and is described as the harmonic term in the distance between atoms 1 and 3 of some of the angle terms. 
The way that these manifest themselves is that, depending on the distance between two bonded atoms, or the angle between three atoms or four atoms in an improper or dihedral, different energies will be assigned. For example, if we look on this chart to the right and we look at the bonds term specifically, we can see that there is an optimal length between two atoms, and depending on the length, a different energy value will be added. Keep in mind that capital E, V, and U are all used to represent energy, and are just different terms for the same thing. The same is true for the non-bonded energy, comprised of van der Waals interactions, also sometimes called the Leonard-Jones term, and the electrostatic interactions, which happen between charged particles. All of this combines into one equation that we can see here, where each contributing energy is given with some variable that are all taken from our input files. Looking at the slightly older version, the charm force field equation, we can see where the different values from calculating the energies come from. We can see that variables with red arrows come from PDB geometry, aka coordinate files, and the variables with blue arrows are taken from the parameter file, while the two variables needed for the electrostatic energy term are taken from the PSF structure file. This is why it is important to have accurate values in your coordinate structure and especially your parameter file. Even a small change in these could massively affect the behavior of the simulation. On the right, we can see a graph that has rated different force fields on their accuracy, a lower number signifying greater agreement with experimental results. It is also important to choose the right force field for your simulation. Some force fields, such as CHARM or OPLS, are specifically designed for biomolecules while others are better at simulating crystallographic or small molecule systems. Now that we have gone over the basics of molecular dynamics, let's have a look at a few more things that we're going to want to keep in mind. The first of these is our solvent model. The presence of a solvent greatly changes the behaviour of a system, and as such it is important to consider solvent models if you want to get the results that agree with experimental data. The simplest thing you could do is ignore the solvent, however, which will often lead to an accurate data and will greatly change the properties of the molecules in our system. The next step up is an implicit solvent model. This is more computationally expensive and we still aren't simulating actual solvent molecules, but instead our program imagines there is a sort of solvent force that permeates our system and applies any relevant forces to our molecules to mimic the presence of a solvent. Finally, we have the explicit solvent model which is the most computationally expensive, but also the most accurate one. We actually fill up our system with solvent molecules and do molecular dynamics calculations on them. Another important thing to consider is our boundary conditions. These will govern the behaviour of our molecules when they come in contact with the simulation box edges or boundaries. Common approaches include solid wall, having a solid wall that deflects or repels atoms when they come in contact with the boundary. Periodic, by far the most common method, as it most closely resembles real life. Periodic boundary conditions mean that if an atom goes into one boundary, it comes out of the opposing boundary. We can th think of this as an ever-repeating unit cell of our simulation space. Some simulation methods delete the atom or simply crash when an atom goes into a boundary. Sometimes we even use a non-cubic simulation space, such as a hexagonal, spherical, or cylindrical shape. There are also simulation protocols that can keep specific things in our system the same by altering different variables. We could refer to a classical molecular dynamic simulation as a microcanonical ensemble, or NVE for short. The NVE stands for the things that we will keep constant, the amount of substance, the volume, and the total energy. Another method is the canonical ensemble, or NVT for short, where the amount of substance, volume and temperature are conserved, which is why it is also referred to as constant temperature molecular dynamics. We can refer to the implementation of this as a thermostat because the temperature is kept constant. The isothermal isobaric ensemble, referred to as NPT, keeps the amount of substance, pressure and temperature constant. In the same way that we had a thermostat to keep the temperature constant, we refer to the method used to conserve the pressure as a barostat. Two more terms that are used very commonly in the world of molecular dynamics are minimalization and equilibration. 
Equilibration is a process that we carry out before our main simulation, where we equilibrate the kinetic and potential energies across the system, usually to sort local groups of high energy or any other unnatural phenomena in our system that usually get created during the heating process, where molecules are provided with energy and therefore the so-called temperature of the system is raised from zero Kelvin to our specified temperature. Minimization is an important process to carry out before our main simulation. It is designed to relax the system, distribute the energy around the system, and get as many atoms or molecules out of their local minima into global minima. If we think back to our system, energy as a three-dimensional field where balls roll down the energy gradients, imagine that a ball started here and rolled down to there. Minimization is designed to get the ball out of that local minima over an energy hump and into a lower global minima. Finally, let's have a look at the applications of molecular dynamics. These include material science, crystallography and polymer simulations, discovering protein folding pathways and protein dynamics, as well as protein-protein interactions, drug design, calculation of free binding energy, the study of protein ligand interactions, general study of biomolecules, such as lipids, proteins, DNA, water, and other solvents. Study of small biological structures, such as viral capsids or ribosomes. And that is by no means a comprehensive list. There are many more niche applications that I am, that I am unable to fit into this presentation, but are still worth checking out. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time.